My chapter explored the way in which the press systems of Britain and America became increasingly entangled and connected and collaborative over the course of the 19th century until they formed what I term a pervasive and powerful cultural contact zone, a space in which readers, writers, uh, editors and illustrators on opposite sides of the Atlantic could encounter one another, often on a daily basis, and exchange news, ideas, language, occasionally some really terrible jokes. And I guess a topic like that is a, an appropriate topic for a project like this, which is itself now a powerful contact zone between readers and researchers around the world. If the press was a transnational project, then I think it's great that we're now writing its history with the same spirit. OK, let's talk about Victorian studies, periodical press, collaboration and interdisciplinarity. One of the things that strikes me about the periodical press and what's happened since the 1960s is precisely the fact that the touchstone of what we do depends so much on collaborative projects. So some good examples. Dictionary of 19th Century Journalism itself, a former Colby winner. The Waterloo Directory of Scottish, English, Irish periodicals and newspapers. And of course, the Wellesley Index. All of these have required teams of individuals working together to actually develop material and produce it and then put it, launch it in a way that's enabled us then to open out the Victorian periodical press studies in ways that we didn't know and couldn't do before. I'd like to congratulate Andrew, Alexis, and John for their heroic efforts at herding Victorian cats and all the other contributors for producing this valuable collection. I am especially delighted that we have won the Robert and Vanetta Colby Award because 35 years ago I had lunch with them in London and they were gracious and encouraging to a very, very young 19th century scholar. I started my task by going through back issues of journals thinking that what had been of interest over the years would also be interesting and relevant to readers of the handbook today. Indeed, virtually every entry in the final chronology can be traced back to one or more articles in VPR or VPN. Effectively, the listing is a double chronology, documenting the pathways of 19th century periodicals, as well as the research interests of RSVP members and contributors over 45 years of periodical scholarship. I also found it difficult to restrict myself to the major periodicals and writers. Many of the most interesting and culturally revealing items refer to less known, more specialized, or ephemeral periodicals. Quirkiness sometimes has its own significance. I want to thank them for their imaginative taxonomies and arrangements in the collection of essays. I'm especially intrigued by their section on geographies. Um, that I think is a really path-breaking approach and it has raised for me a number of possibilities that I might pursue in the future. And my aim was to show that despite Wales being a small country, it had a tremendous diversity in its periodicals in the 19th century with different political viewpoints, different religions, and of course a periodical press in two different languages. I hope that not only people will enjoy reading about the diversity of Wales's periodical press in the 19th century, but also that scholars will take the opportunity to investigate links between the Welsh periodical press and those in the Celtic nations, in England, and also in the Welsh colonies in the Americas and Australia. I live in Hawaii about as far away from Britain as you can get. But the two kingdoms were very much entwined in the 19th century. So, here are two famous buildings that show that influence. First, Alitio Lani Hale, once the Kingdom Legislature and now the Supreme Court of Hawaii, and Police Headquarters on Hawaii 5 -0. Second, Iolani Palace, the home of the last monarchs and of the Royal Library, which subscribed to Blackwoods, Cornhill, Punch, and many other periodicals. I might have mentioned this before, but most 19th century newspapers and periodicals were published outside of London. There were provincial publications. And this means that 19th century uh, periodical publishing was decentered, it was dispersed, and it was more distributed than you might think. Lots of little local things can make up a national picture 
and I think the local press was a national phenomenon. It used many of the same journalistic techniques and formats and genres as the London press, but it had an extra dimension, an extra vocabulary, which was a sense of place. And just as now is different from then, here is different from there. Place matters. Since the groundbreaking chapter by Alwyn Neeson in Victorian periodicals and Victorian society, there hasn't really been a collection with another chapter on temperance periodicals. And I do hope that if it doesn't fill people with my enthusiasm for such periodicals, at least it will introduce people to the range and the general significance of this huge area of Victorian periodical study. While I use periodicals a lot in my work on the Victorian theatre, I've never had the opportunity to sit and think about periodicals in their own right. So this was very interesting for me and I learnt a lot about the ways in which periodicals themselves started to structure the debates and discourse around theatre and theatricality in the 19th century. What I also learnt was... Um, something about the energy, the entrepreneurial nature and the innovation of theatre periodicals, particularly in the first half of the 19th century, and the ways in which that, that those editorial practices uh, reflected many of the managerial practices of theatre in the same period. Hi everyone. I had such a good time doing the research and the writing for my chapter on children's periodicals, particularly because I got to sort of expand beyond my primary research focus of girls' magazines to think about children's print culture more broadly. And the one thing that was most interesting to me as I was doing the research was the way in which digitization has really changed the nature of children's periodical research. So I guess I have two things that I want, always want to remember when I'm doing periodicals research, and one, is that we need to go back to the archive. There's uh, obviously a much bigger uh, representation of children's periodicals than we see in a digitized form. And second, we need to continue to encourage these digital publishers to do more um, and expand their collection. Uh, I had known about um, early 19th century serial poems, for example, like Dr. Syntax's tour, but I hadn't realized it was serialized in one of the earliest poetry magazines that featured original poetry, Rudolf Ackerman's poetical magazine that ran from 1809 to 10. So I learned from having to write this essay as a long 19th century essay rather than a Victorian one. Um, I got into periodical studies um, in part because of a book I stumbled across called The Victorian Periodical Press, Samplings and Soundings. This was, of course, edited by Joan Shattuck and Michael Wolfe, and it led me towards my dissertation topic, which was representations of women readers in Victorian family magazines. And um, so it was a real honor for me to contribute to this collection in which I was able to revisit the definition of what a Victorian family magazine really is. One of the key factors that drives what we do uh, in the area itself, because of the fact that it depends so much on talent across the board, there is no way that we can actually tackle the entirety of the periodical press in the Victorian period, given the thousands of, of, of journals that appeared at that time, without that type of input and that type of collaboration. It strikes me that one of the things that is very key to the continuing survival of our study is precisely the fact people have been so willing to put time and effort into pulling together and drawing out this type of material for future scholars. And I'm very pleased, of course, that the Colby Prize winner this year happens to be precisely a volume that does exactly that. It was great being involved in it, and particularly I appreciated the international dimension. We tend to take this for granted in the world of Victorian periodicals now, but it is ever more important, particularly with the chauvinism and xenophobia, indeed, which we're seeing. And Victorian periodicals has been a trailblazing field in which we work internationally. So this collection is rightly emphasising that group spirit. Hello, everyone.
Greetings to Freiburg from the UK. Thanks to Barbara, Stephanie, the conference organizing committee and the conference team for setting up this technologically challenging session. First of all, I'd like to express my personal delight and sense of honor that our collection of essays has won the Robert and Benita Colby Prize this year. I want to thank the jury very much indeed for believing in the value of what we've tried to do. I also, of course, want to thank publicly my extraordinary co-editors and our wonderful contributors, many of whom I know are there in the room with you, and others of whom you've just seen and heard. I'm sorry I can't be with you personally, but family duties prevent me from attending. I shall be following the whole conference on Twitter, talking of which. If you have any questions or comments, please do tweet me. Um, you can, of course, use the more established technology of email, too. Now, you've just seen some contributors give examples of different kinds of boundary crossing and collaboration. And I know Alexis and John are going to speak about different conceptualizations of collaboration in a few minutes. I hope that what you've heard and are going to hear later might activate for you what I'm going to be exploring here concerning collaboration and the double nature of the press as labor and text. First, collaborative working, the coming together of people across borders to create something. And secondly, the collaborative nature of text to generate meaning, in a word, intertextuality, which needs to be generated by readers, or rather by what I prefer to call users, as reading might not be a priority, as we'll find out. How might we visualize or conceptualize such collaborations? There are various ways indeed. I'm sure I'm missing out on many of the latest in not being with you. But I want for the moment to return to a 19th century visualization, the Venn diagram. One of the proposals we made in the introduction to the handbook concerned the Venn diagrammatic nature of the press. That is, we can visualize the press as sets of discourses and categories overlapping one another in various configurations, or not, as the case may be. Similarly, the press is produced by the collaboration and intersection of many categories of labor and laborers. Venn diagrams might help us understand the relations in either case or even between these two different kinds of categories. It's an emic procedure, as you see, as Venn diagrams are first set before the public in a periodical, which won't surprise you, I'm sure. Venn doesn't use the term collaboration at all in his article, but nonetheless, I want us to keep in mind this visual metaphor and its implications for what it means to work together. Now, one of the tasks of the student of 19th century periodicals and newspapers is to identify its categories and discourses, labor and laborers, and what their relationships to each other are, how they work together, or if they conflicted, and how and to what end. Why and how did the various kinds of the producers of the press select what conceptual and generic sets to overlay or juxtapose? Sometimes it might seem that a user is left free to make their own intertextual connections, as I might read this illustration of the climactic tableau from a prodigal sun melodrama through, say, the conventions of history painting. But very often the placing and selection of textual units are made for specific purposes, such as you can see here. Users, amongst whom we map up one category, might never register those without attention to the material locations of the particular text we're examining, the layout of the page, for example, or the selection and sequence of items in a number or even in a run. As scholars, we're judged by how aware we are of the conventional decoding practices of the discipline and what, of, in what Linda Hughes has called reading sideways. This is an established practice by now which distinguishes our discipline from that of, say, history or art history. And yet there's often a struggle between producers and users. For of course, users can resist or simply not see the intentions of the producers or not know the conventions. This possibility is something we often overlook as our training urges us to try to identify what producers wanted, not with how users resisted. 
we'll learn on the whole to be diligent and obedient readers of the press, even if we later go on to denounce the intentions we read there. So, how does that relate to the winner of the Colby Prize, the handbook? Well, Alexis, John and I might well want readers to read the handbook in certain ways, and the introduction and the sequence of chapters are signs of that, but we can't compel readers to read that. We rely on a fantasy of obedient reading, just as I did in the previous slide, when I read the breaking of the sailors' strike typologically, simply by following the conventional repoussoir of the prodigal son illustration. And yet, indeed, resistance and collaboration need not be sets in a Venn diagram that can never overlap. It may be that we need to look for traces of such an overlap between obedience and resistance. I know many of you in this room have done just that, if not always in so many words. And I know again that I'm missing new ways of thinking through and perhaps working through that opposition between obedience and resistance. But bear with me while I look again at the handbook and how disobedient users has an impact upon me as a reader and then as a producer. I want to look again at our cover image, Robert Walker Macbeth's Our First Tip. In the introduction to the handbook, we discuss the different ways it's described in the reviews as a painting and then when Macbeth brought it out as an etching. How did remediation affect the discourses attached to this painting? But it's not remediation I want to think about. I want to relate an episode from the production of the handbook regarding this image. Alex, John and I were wondering what we wanted on the cover and we came up with various possibilities. Alexis found our first tip after a search on the web, but it wasn't uh, the only possible image we came up with. I must confess, I was initially dead set against it, as to me it reiterated all too unambiguously the masculine appropriation of the press, while the wife is making a peace offering of sugar. It seemed to be such a conventionally saccharine text, but even if it placed itself in the tradition of Victorian problem painting, to me pretty obviously, it didn't seem to me a problem at all. The editorial team couldn't decide, so as some of you may remember, I asked for advice via social media. I was surprised that respondents liked our first TIFF more than any of the other possibilities. I was even more surprised by how they read the image. She's putting arsenic in his tea. The dog is doing something naughty against the husband's leg. And so on. Reading against the grain, resistant reading, seemed their norm, even while respondents liked the picture. Respondents were both resisting what seems a dominant message and yet supporting the messenger. At the same time, respondents were collaborating with us by stating and explaining their preferences. And through their pleasurably disobedient readings, I began to see the painting anew, to see its problems and the difficulty of their resolution. What was the relationship of this painting to Adam and Eve in the Paradise Garden? Look at the gate on the left. What does it say of the future? Is the couple shut in or out? What of the significance of what looks like a huge sequoia whose trunk provides a backdrop to the action? Is the action even taking place in Britain? Since the sequoia was only introduced in, to Britain in 1854, the tree seems rather large for a 24-year growth. Or is it supposed to be just a generic ancient tree containing the action as only a petty squabble and reminding us rather of a greater and more stable, perhaps even natural, institution, marriage. Is this image then an ironic commentary on the 1878 revision of the Matrimonial Causes Act, so much discussed in the news? But then there are other readings too. Is the husband using the newspaper not to read about opinions on divorce or party politics or the economy, but merely to escape the present? Perhaps he's not reading for information in order to integrate himself into the public sphere. Well, the idea of the masculine public sphere seems risable, if that's the case. In short, my reader's collaborative disobedience made me look again. And I was, in the process, 
one round to our first tip. So much that those of you who were able to come to the book launch in Greenwich last year will know how I took the image apart in the rolling PowerPoint in, on display. I turned various parts of it. The husband's clenched left hand, the wife's eyes, the proffered sugar, the teapot, the pond, the set of fruit, the garden door, the dog, other elements, into symbols for themes of the book and chapters, temperance, music, art, theatre, the transnational, technology, and so on. And that was only possible because of the wonderfully disrespectful reading colleagues made of this image. You, readers, colleagues, contributors, users, you opened my eyes to new possibilities, new intertextual collaborations in completely unexpected ways. And this, in turn, allowed me, allowed us, collectively, to produce a new. This outcome sprang not from a planned setting of team goals and milestones and a division of labour charted by organisational flowcharts and timelines, nor from the sequencing of texts, layout and careful editing, so as to try to govern meaning through, though goodness knows they're all important too but from an unruly sharing of your joy and creative focus on a topic. This is a different kind of collaboration from the mechanics and management of production, but collaboration nonetheless. The casual opening of new connections, joyful, jarring, disobedient, resisting. If I have one wish for the future of the handbook, it is that it might stand to remind its users that both our topic of research and our enterprise, our discourse and our labour, are not only generously collective and collaborative, but a Venn diagram where fun overlaps with seriousness, joy with critical acuity, obedience with resistance. I want to promote collaboration that disrespects borders between production and reproduction, contributors and readers, producers and users. Collaboration that no respect of geographies, taxonomies, media, cultural hierarchies, while acknowledging that those borders are very real and very powerful. Now, to identify and then cross borders and work together isn't always a good thing in itself. We know it can be a mechanical reflex or performed for oppressive ends, as Anne-Marie reminded us a few moments ago, and as my reading of the ILN page suggested, but to collaborate ethically so as to enable or provoke new thinking and new knowledge remains vital. That's the kind of cross-border collaboration and overlap. I hope you'll agree with Bob Nicholson and me that the handbook both promotes and results from. Thank you once more for the honour you're bestowing upon all the tens of people who enabled the handbook to exist. For all those we named in our in acknowledgments to the nameless production assistants, designers, and the indexer. And now I leave you in the very capable breathing presences of my wonderful co-editors.